Life's Unshadows of Homeopathy. Irma came to my office in March 1991. She was a 68-year-old and lived with two sisters. She had been a widow since she was 30 years old. Had no children. She was working as an accountant in a car parts factory despite her health problem and the fact that she was old enough to be retired. Her problems began at an early age. At the age of 12, she received a tetanus vaccine and she suffered from an edema reaction in, reaction in her face and neck like a quinquus edema. Then she continued with problems of that type. She related it to the, that vaccine every two or three months that were successfully, successfully treated with allopathic medication. After six, seven years, the edema also appeared in the legs and ankles. After 10 years, the present clinical picture was installed that worsened despite all the treatments she underwent. First, in her feet and then in her hands, a great dryness appeared, hyperkeratosis and cracks that were gradually worsened until they became deep and bleeding. She used local corticosteroid and mustaducin creams, creams and also oral medication which made the lesions partially improve and then everything got worse. She came to my office with bandage that covered his feet and hands, stained with blood that was the usual thing. The physical examination showed deep cracks that oozed a serosanguinous liquid. There was no other medical background except a wart on the neck. She told me, I have a morose character, strong and bossy. I don't like that someone contradict me. Despite that, I was a very good relationship with the factory workers. I don't treat them badly if there is no reason. I also yell if something is wrong to the factory owners. I am very responsible, I don't leave until the work is finished. I have seven absences in 20 years of working. I have few friends, but deep. I am quiet in meetings, rather withdrawn, introverted, as if I feel bad, I stay still in bed and in two hours it goes away. I haven't made more progress at work because of I collide with those above me. Rather serious, difficult, difficult for me to make a joke. I am too direct. I am severe. If someone disappoints me, he's dead. I am spiteful. I don't show affection. I reproach to the children, grandnephews, but they love me. Nothing in life has shocked me too much, not even the death of my husband. About the weather, sadness in the mountains, perspiration, hardly perspire, time a usual and noticeable sadness when it got dark, menses, appear very early, night years, climateric without problems, libido diminish, sleep with problems, wakes up frequently within two or three hours of falling asleep. She doesn't remember dreams, fears at thunderstorms. She was a person with little demonstration of uh, affectivity very hardworking, serious, with little communication, 
and introverted. Despite her strong character, she was appreciated both by her bosses and by the factory workers. Her grand nephews also loved her, although she was demanding of them. Let's see the repertorization with the most objective symptoms as many homeopaths who mistrust of taking the mental symptoms work. There are silicea, sulfur, lycopodium, arsenicum, graphitis, calcaria, sepia, ep this Eight remedies cover the totality of symptoms. But if we consider the mental symptoms, there is not, no, not too much to doubt. In the prescription, I had to choose between Lycopodium, Clavatum, and Arsenicum album. Sepia could have been another option, but I don't consider sepia as having the symptom dictatorial. It is an addition except perhaps with the husband or the wife. Lycopodium clavatum was added in some repertories in disorder for vaccination, so it could be indicated. In this symptom, we have gone from nine remedies in the chem repertory to 105, as we see below. She received several ascending potencies of Lycopodium clavatum with partial improvement. Her characterology and her sleep never changed. She kept working, she said, just like a man. 100 responsible, 100%. At work, people tell me, please, never die. Since her skin was better, but not completely improved, and there were no other change, and taking into account that miasmatic characteristic of her pathology, I switched it for arsenicum album. The healing of the cracks took place with great joy of the patient. She was also surprised by the return of an inflama inflammation in the region of the her right ankle. The first place where she had the swelling after the vaccination she received in her job. And I was also happy since there was a return of an old symptom. Perhaps her law was being fulfilled. Her skin was fine, her skin was fine, and even though she didn't sleep well, she was very pleased. At that point, she told me a peculiarity that she had not told me before. At night, when she slept, and from time to time, her sisters told her, told that she screamed and she did so asking for help. I wrote it down, but I didn't change the arsenicum, although it doesn't have that symptom, given the fact that arsenicum had done, had done her so good. Seven years after her, after her first consultation, and already freed from the skin pathology, she begins with prominent bronchospasm, a lot of dyspnea, which did not change at all with different potencies of arsenicum. There were no clear modalities of the clinical picture. I visited her at her home, she told me with difficulty with you to her shortness of breath. It makes me feel very uncomfortable, uncomfortable that I can fulfill with you. She didn't have the money to pay for my visit. And even with dyspnea and fatigue, she repeated, lamenting. I have achieved everything in my life with effort, with a lot of effort. Now, let me talk about the way that I take a case clinic influenced by the Escuela Medica Homeopathica Argentina, Tomás Pablo Pasquero, and by teachers such as Eugenio Candegave, Salman Brofman, Juan Schaffer, Luis de Tinis, Marcelo Candegave, 
Alfonso Masi Lizalde, and so many colleagues who had awake me, awake in me a passion for homeopathy to which I had my own thoughts. As Hahnemann Warner as in Organon paragraph seven, only the externally observable symptoms are the visible manifestation of the internal disease. He said in paragraph seven, so it is the totality of symptoms that outer image expressing the inner essence of the disease, of this disturbed, disturbed vital force that must be the main, even the only means by which the disease allows us to find the, nece the necessary remedy, the only one that can decide the appropriate choice. We know that not only the symptoms of the pathology for which the patient consults, in this case of Irma the skin, are the totality of symptoms that the chronic disease manifests. The chronic disease is also shown with those characteristics of the general order or in the characterology of the patient that condition his or her life. Indeed, Ken already told us of the demotion of the nature of the human being to the nature of a substance that degrades him her in his her feelings and action and that is what determines his her chronic disease. Tomás Pablo Pasquero was a faithful representative of the way of thinking and he told us about the restriction that chronic disease produce in the human being freedom. I subscribe to an anthropological conception of the human being in which the disease is in an imbalance of human nature, similar to the nature of a substance that dynamically manifests itself in the psych psychophysical totality. There is a common thread in the way of getting thick and according for a vital diagnostic map, whether a constitutional remedy or some, or some palliative remedy can be found depending on the case. This vital diagnostic map is given by the intensity and coherence of the vital principle that manifests its imbalance with the symptoms. The restriction in the freedom of each person is produced by specific issues of each homeopathic substance. The substance not only has an organic tropism in the way that manifests itself, but also infuses the whole psychophysical and provides its own picture in the unit that the human being is. Margaret Tyler presented the study of remedies as drug pictures, pictures that help us understand these themes of styles of existence that are transmitted in the way of living in each patient. In this regard, when I study a remedy, I try to incorporate the central subjects, the leitmotiv of each one of them, which must coincide, if it is found, with the leitmotiv of the way of existence that the chronic disease imprints in each, in the patient, on the patient. It is always fine? The answer is no. Luckily, we have also the characteristic symptom and also the strong characterological symptoms to find the similium. A word of caution is in order here. Inventing remedies, terms, or interpretation of a patient's life have to be avoided. I must differentiate here the use of understanding in a case or the study of the problem of remedy 
from the use of interpretation. Hahnemann warned us so much about not to interpret it in organon when he spoke of the observer free of prejudice. Observer free of prejudice. Understanding is a resource of the so-called science of the spirit, as Wilhelm, Wilhelm Dilthe called them, and that proposed a way of knowing to the objects of, ex, of the study. This is opposed to the scientific explanation, a resource of the natural science. Understanding is then taken up for the hermeneutic philosophical thought. The characteristic of understanding applied to a medical consultation of homeopathy comes from the interaction between the doctor and his her patient. In this encounter, the doctor gathers all possible information that the patient offers and tries to catch a coherence of the way of his her existence in, in balance. In the vital imbalance that is expressed by the chronic disease that the patient endures. This coherence is also sought in the study of the remedies to take it into account in case it appears in the taking of the clinical case. Themes arise in the study, topics that are typical of rich remedy. In the anamnesis, the doctor must be attentive to their appearance in the patient. In the case of Irma, the word of effort, a lot of effort, resounded in my ears, which I have incorporated as a central term in Rus Toxicodendron Remedy. Indeed, the remedy for overexertion, are, as Ernest Farrington mentioned, is not only manifested in a, an acute physical condition, but also as a theme of the person's life dynamically influenced by the chronic disease. Suddenly, everything lit up. The patient's entire life was dedicated to her work. Her travels and achievement were related to events that she experienced in that area, and she cared about the firm where she worked as if she were the owner, her owner. Her affectivity has al was always displaced toward this area. I had Rustocks as a candidate for that historical and characteristic symptom that she had expressed to me in the consultation, shrieks for help during sleep. There, Rustox appears among three remedies during that cover the symptom. Also, other characteristics of the, of the patient appear covered by Rustox. To begin with, it is one of the remedies as we saw in disorders due to vaccination. The phone is Benihausen. Moreover, the feature in her history of the onset of menses. We all know well the acute febrile condition typical of this remedy, as well as disorders caused by physical exertion. Likewise, we know its tropes towards the muscular and osteoarticular system, as well as its indication in vesicular diseases of the skin, mainly of the herpes zoster type. But we can make a better understanding of the symptoms if we correlate them in a vital attitude that infuse the flow of life of the patient in chronic disease. The fever is with agitation, restlessness, and fear of death, as we know uh, that the classic has compared to a conic tune and arsenicum. In this remedy, restlessness and movement are 
essential since one of its symptoms forsaken is related to death that is evoked by stillness. We read in Heron's, Heron's guiding symptoms, melancholy, ill humor, and anxiety as if a misfortune would happen or as if she were alone and all about her were dead and still. A stillness is an evo evocation of death, conditions the patient to sustain movement, which, as is known, improves the pain and anxiety. The propensity to have to move together with the characterization of the anxiety of the consciousness makes the patient have to dedicate to some productivity activity. When in heaven we read, Christ without cause, imagine people are finding fault with her because she's earning nothing. Acts in a child's manner, we understand why the patient must work hard to earn enough money to live. This is how the efforts, physically activity, and work appear in different delusions and dreams, thus showing us an issue that speaks of a coherence in the way of presenting itself as a central problem in the chronic disease that requires rus toxicodendron. Prescribed rus tox 200 plus and the dyspnea went away quickly. She began to sleep better and the swelling in her right ankle reappeared. She told me, I work from 6.45 a.m. to 5 p.m. and I'm not so tired at the end of the day. I couldn't be without doing nothing. At this point, she was already 76 years old. After that, successively, a rash appeared on her neck that passed, an inflammation of the guns, an oral mucosa that she had with when she was eight years old, something that she had forgotten. Since that episode, I have never had to use a remedy other than rustox in different potencies. In the course of the treatment, she referred me to another symptom that she had never told me before, a sensation at that time that she was all, she, that she had had occasionally, that she was feeling through, failing through the bed as into a vacuum. Also the symptom is in the remedy. The last sensation also correspond to the central theme of the patient who requires Rustox. In bed, the place of rest, the problem <laughs> reappears. Uh, the last sensation, the central theme of the patient who requires Rustox. In bed, the place of rest, the problem appear, which are also revealed in the delusions. There are two delusions with this topic. The study of the remedies through analogy, symbology, and mythology give us a coherence in a certain mode of existence that the system imprints to the patient. Just like the tireless worker Sisyphus until I saw her at 82, Irma continued to be the trusted employee of the owner of the company in London accounting and administrative tax, which she continued to carry out very early in the morning when she took the public transport that takes her to work. I want to emphasize that looking for similar topics between patient and remedy in no way replaced the search of homeopathic symptoms which guide us to the choice of the remedy. We have seen an example of the brightness that homeopathy can achieve when it comes to 
the remedy, we all seek the similimum. Now, this paper is intentionally called Lights and Shadows of Homeopathy, since I intend to exemplify the lights with this case, how homeopathy is effective and produce healing, but also to make some reflection a shadow of our practice. Let us now some issues inherent to the exercise that could be followed if a by a discipline that claims to be considered a scientific practice. This leads us to several considerations of a philosophical order. First, what is science and what is a scientific practice? Second, is medicine a science and or its exercise a scientific practice? Finally, is homeopathic therapy a scientific practice? The medical establishment doesn't ask much about the different conception of science in the story of thought and, accept, and accepts medical practice as scientific without much question. That is why if we want homeopathy to be accepted in the dominant medical field, we must make an effort to enter through clinical evidence or research on the action of remedies, usual point of attack of those who demand scientific rigor. Much has already been said in this regard and will continue to be. Now, apart from what they demand of us, we can ask the question, how accurate is our practice so that it can be considered a scientific practice? Taking this case that has been successful, even with the so-called love of Helen, although we know that it cannot be considered that way as low from the point of view of the philosophy of science. Classically, we consider what, that when return symptoms appear, we are on the right path. In this case, that was true with Rustox, but there has been also a symptomatic return when the patient improved the, her pathology with arsenicum. Is her in law? Is her in law? The law that tells us of a memory of the chronic disease process, the evidence of having been, of having given the, the so desired, desired similimum or can similar remedies produce it at least partially? This question remains open for further discussion. Let us now consider the symptoms which are our most faithful tool for taking the case. We are well aware of the problems that proving bring us, both ancient and contemporary. The old ones for being a many, in many case, cases limited in terms of the number of proverbs. In the case of Rustox, a remedy so used by us in acute disease, Hahnemann made this proving of it in company with nine of his fellow, and he also recorded symptoms from reports in medical journals. Toxicity to toxicity symptoms. In scientific terms, is it that the data provided by a proving carried out by 10 people robust? However, that first proving provided the basis for this remedy to be used and successful. Then symptoms, symptoms of clinical observation of many eminent homeopaths were incorporated. Another problem that we have in our practice in the is the transcription of the symptoms that appear in the provings to the repertoire that we, should, 
that we use. We know, we know for the work of Cloud Helen Shipser and others about the different types of mistakes that can be found in transcription as well as omissions that are also frequently found. Let's see an example of IFMA case. If the patient has told, had told me earlier the keynote, I mentioned maybe the prescription would have been easier. Shrieking, screaming, shouting for help in sleep, or rather shrieking for help, jumping out from bed in sleep. However, the later could also be a matter of discussion, since the referent is from Yar's repertoire, but the symptom in Timothy Allen's Encyclopedia of Pure Materia Medica is anxiety at night. He would flee from bed and seek help on account of an indescribable distressing sensation. This symptom is not exactly the same since my patient screamed in her sleep and did not wake up and shut out of bed looking for help. In any case, can the action of the request for help that appears while awake in the prover and during sleep in the patient be taken as the same symptom despite not being sucked? For those who are purist of the literalness of symptoms, this is unacceptable. For those who believe like me that the language of the prover and also that of the patient must be considered according to, his, to, to the intention, there is no problem. Now, let's see about the symptoms I took. In the case, in the case I have presented, let us recall re repertorization. As we can see, Uh, as we can see, excuse me, just a minute. Rustos cover five of the six symptoms. Does not cover the sum of cracked skin feet plus cracked skin soles plus cracked feet soles. Bleeding. However, in the chapter skin, cracked rustox appears with a value four appearing as an important remedy for the skin pathology. And we see here in the Benninghausen Boyer repertory. The question that remains is should, is, should the symptom cracks have been taken in the skin and not in the in extremities? Can the local characterization of the symptoms become an obstacle to finding the similimum in the case? That is to say, should we use a repertoire like the, that of Benninghausen and leave aside that of Ken? On the other hand, let us another repertory which would have helped if it had considered the familiarity of Ruktos with Ruth Venenata. Ruth Venenata is in skin cracks, fissures, bleeding, and in extremity cracks, fissures, bleeding. Should we take into account the familiarity of the remedy, at least in these highly characteristic symptoms of the, at the time of the prescription? Let us see what place Bruce Stock have, has in the mental symptoms that could have been considered. As we can see, Bruce Stock doesn't cover the symptoms dictatorial and intolerant of contradiction. However, in Dynamics repertory in the rubric contradiction ailment from, we find Bruce Stock's the source in this is 
the sixth edition of the Ken repertoire. Regarding to the symptoms dictatorial, it is a characterological symptom that in my usual practice, I doesn't take it for re the repertorization if there are well characteristic symptoms. Since I use the pure homeopathy methodology created by Marcelo Candegave and Hugo Carrara. The objective of this methodology is to take the symptoms for repertorization that could have greater objectivity and avoid these that may arise from the subjectivity of the observer. It is just that a feature like that may not a true symptom, but simply, simply a secondary character trait in the patient case of the need of working efficiently. Another question that could be arise to me, in fact, when I present cases in the conferences that I gave in different countries, I am frequently asked about this. Is why did I choose the different dynamization that I indicate? At my school, I've learned certain parameters of prescription according to the presentation of symptoms or the severity of the clinical picture. However, I am well aware that other homeopaths use other parameters. Those of us who have many years of practice know that it is something that corresponds more to the intuition of each, pre each prescriber and that there are not fixed rules, even since the times of Hahnemann. My intention in bringing these doubts and questions is to show some questioning that the medical community of the biomedical paradigm that predominates today could make us apart from the criticism that they usually make of us. After more than 35 years of practice, it surprised me that those who want to reveal homeopathy are always based on the same criticisms, and they don't notice certain characteristics that we could consider as weaknesses of our daily work in the office. They could be considered like this since they, since they don't allow an accurate professional practice of homeopathy. However, these supposed weaknesses don't prevent our professional practice and success in healing many patients. We must continue to defend homeopathy as a scientific practice since it has demonstrated and demonstrates on a daily basis the cure of disease through the healing of sick people. And there is a lot of evidence that show it. But the practice of homeopathy, and in my opinion of medicine in general, goes beyond what biomedicine considers to be medical science. Our supposed weaknesses don't prevent us from understanding the topics presented by the substance that are communicated through provings, even imperfect ones, or through the patients we see in our consulting rooms. The only warning is that we must avoid imaginative, on imaginative speculations that lead us away from considering the proving of, or the symptoms the only starting point for the consideration of each clinical cases. <laughs> Surely at some point when all prejudice, huh, all prejudice and vested interests are overcome, 
Homeopathy will be accepted by the medical establishment of the current dominant paradigm, since it meets the requirement requested by evidence-based medicine. In this way, we still be able to integrate homeopathy, homeopathic therapy into the different health systems, a situation that already exists in some countries. Medicine considered as a science has a lot of authority, so much so that it can induce countries to carry out massi massive quarantines or recommended universal treatments without the corresponding validation steps. But when we talk about homeopathy as scientific practice, we must think that our therapy is science as a manifestation of the knowledge of a theory about health and disease and a proposed thera therapy that is verified in practice, but it is also an art sin since it depends not only on the theoretical knowledge of the doctor, but also on the creative resources of the understanding of the clinical case that is faces. I add, finally, let us not lose the humanistic conception that our practice has had since its inception from Hahnemann to the present day in the desire to consider homeopathy as scientific. It is a legacy that Tomal Pablo Pasquero and other great homeopaths have defended with determination. Muchas gracias por su atención.